I'm David Acton, Curator of Photographs at the Snipe Museum. Here are some ideas about our exhibition, Touchstones of the 20th Century. I'd like to talk today about a group of Polaroid prints in our exhibition by Andy Warhol. Photographs that seem slight and confusing, but are actually images that represent a very interesting artist and a very interesting part of his creative process. Andy Warhol was born in Pittsburgh in 1928, and he grew up there in a working class family as a devout Catholic. He was an artist from childhood and studied industrial design and illustration at the Carnegie Institute of Technology. And in 1949, after graduating, he went to New York to pursue a career as an illustrator. Warhol quickly got work as an illustrator and designer for magazines in New York City. And in his spare time, he created designs, and published prints which were hand-colored by he and his friends in his apartment. In the late 1950s, Warhol Hall became interested in pop art, a new painting style that had its origins in Great Britain. It used the illustration and popular design of comic books and commercial imagery to reflect on modern life. Warhol selected some very obvious and well-known images from American commercial design and isolated them as if they were works of fine art in the gallery. Most famous were his paintings on canvas of Campbell's soup cans, which seemed to have been lifted directly from advertising. On the right, I'm showing a printed object that Warhol created in his studio by constructing boxes of plywood and printing them with screen print on all six sides with the imagery of the boxes printed for delivery to grocery stores. Warhol also lifted photo-generated images from magazines and newspapers, which he blew up to over life size and printed on canvas with silk screens. And these were exhibited in the gallery as if they were works of fine art. The key image in this development were his canvases of Elvis Presley, lifted from advertisements for movies featuring Elvis. Sometimes he used the same screens overlapping to create images like this, which is a painting he called Double Elvis. Warhol also used images of movie stars and celebrities that were instantly recognizable. And he made these silkscreen prints and paintings on canvas using the screens in his studio called The Factory, which I'm showing on the left. This is an image of the Silver Factory, so-called because Warhol and his friends painted the inside of the loft with silver paint and covered the walls with aluminum foil. The factory became a center for Warhol's friends and an ongoing party and also a place where he gathered friends to help him with his works of art. One of the most famous works from this period is Warhol's Marilyn. On the left, I'm showing a photograph which was a publicity still that Warhol took and derived an image that he then transferred to silk screens and separated into several screens, one for the key image representing the photographic material, and several others in which he overlaid colors. This allowed him to change the colors as he made these prints. Warhol and the troop of friends that he had enlisted printed these images on sheets of paper three feet square and changed the colors, creating ten different editions of Maryland prints. 
1967. These were published in portfolios of 250 impressions of 10 different versions of these Marilyns. They became enormously popular and enormously famous and influential in the pop art world. Next, Warhol took an image that he lifted from a magazine which showed a group of flowers, and he and his friends similarly transferred the images from the photograph printed through screens in a magazine, enlarged and made into silk screens which were then enhanced by different colored screens, and published another group of limited edition prints called Flowers. In 1968, a hanger-on to the factory who had emotional problems shot Warhol, and he was very seriously injured by a gunshot to the chest, which required five hours of surgery and two years of recuperation. And when Warhol came back to the studio, he started developing his own designs from his own photographs, which is to say not stealing the photographic imagery from other published images, but creating his own images with a Polaroid camera. The Polaroid camera was a product introduced to the American market in 1948, utilizing a system developed by Dr. Edwin Land that made it possible to create prints which developed themselves inside and outside the camera. The Polaroid camera went through many different developmental stages from the 40s into the 50s and up through the 70s, making it possible to create individual instant prints from cameras that became progressively more affordable and simpler to operate. Here I'm showing you a television advertisement showing how the Polaroid became more and more popular and more and more accessible to a wider audience until such time as it became a normal part of American life. The Polaroid technology utilized several layers of sensitized paper which were pulled out of the camera, and with that action, packet of chemical developers was dragged across the surface of the print, which developed over time. In later Polaroid cameras of the 1970s, this took place within the camera, and a print was ejected from the front beneath the lens. Warhol loved the Polaroid camera, and particularly a version called the Big Shot, which was made in the 70s primarily for photographic portraits. You see him on the right aiming his Big Shot at the camera, and in the small inset image, he poses with a group of Polaroid portraits taken during one evening out at the clubs because Warhol was habitué of the club scene and particularly Studio 54 in New York City in the 1980s. You see him here with the cameras in his hand in the lower left with his friends at Studio 54. This is a group of Polaroids that Warhol took in his nights out at the nightclub on one exciting night, obviously, in which a pig was among the clubbers. Here's Warhol holding a big shot camera and taking a portrait of the singer Debbie Harry, one of a series that he used to develop later into larger portrait canvases. And here's one of those canvases, now in a museum collection, being installed. You can see that it utilizes the same elements as Warhol's screen print paintings of the 1960s. The photographic imagery is transferred to the canvas with screen print, and then other colors are applied over that black imagery through another group of screen prints and sometimes touched with a brush. Here is a Warhol portrait of Princess Caroline with one of the Polaroids probably taken in the corridor at a nightclub and later developed into a full-scale color portrait. 
Warhol at this point was making a fortune from these portraits, all commissioned by friends among celebrities and also among those he met at the nightclub. One of these was a commissioned portrait of the fashion designer Giorgio Armani. On the left, we see the Polaroid in our exhibition at the Snipe, and on the right, one of a pair of large-scale canvas portraits derived from this series. Another of the Polaroids in our exhibition represents a group of shoes. This was one of a large series that Warhol made in preparation for an advertisement for a shoe line by his friend, the fashion designer Halston. One day, Halston sent a big box of shoes to the factory. Not pairs of shoes, but single shoes, which were dumped onto the factory floor Warhol went around them and made Polaroids shooting down on the floor of the shoes as they fell out and slightly rearranged. And these were later made into colored images with screen printing that were then developed into the advertisement you see on the right for Halston Shoes by Garolini, which appeared in Vogue magazine. Later, the artist took many of these images and developed them into a series of screen prints. He made them particular to the time and place by dusting them when the screen printing ink was wet with industrial diamond dust so that when the prints were framed and hung on the wall, they glittered. Orho was a dog lover. Here you see him on the right with his beloved dachshund Archie, whom he carried around with him to restaurants, to gallery openings, and to the light nightclub. Many of his friends who were also dog lovers wanted portraits of their pets made into full-scale paintings. And so Warhol developed the idea of creating images of dogs and cats that became very expensive portrait paintings. The portrait on the left of a spaniel called Palm is a case in point. Warhol made many Polaroids of this dog. He then blew up into large-scale portrait paintings. Here you see Palm transferred into two screen prints, one of which was a print on paper, and the one on the right, a print transferred to canvas and touched by hand with paint. Warhol later developed this idea into a series of screen prints which he published here are two prints from the series, one of which represents Archie on the right. In the late 1980s, Orwell was using his Polaroid to develop designs for a group of screen prints that he published to wide acclaim. One of these represented figures from American mythology, and among those figures was Santa Claus. On the left, you see the Polaroid in our exhibition representing Santa. You can see that he's very different from the popular Santa of American lore made popular in the 1940s and 50s by the Coca-Cola ads. In fact, the Santa in the Polaroid is much more akin to the kind of dressed-up old man that many of us experienced as young children in the department store. On the right, you can see the silkscreen that eventually came from this series of Polaroid studies. Here, along with nine of the 12 images from Warhol's series of American myths, including such figures as Mickey Mouse, Hottie Doody, Superman, and the Wicked Witch of the West. I'm David Acton, Curator of Photographs at the Snipe Museum, hoping you'll join us again for some observations on our exhibition, Touchstones of the 20th Century.